knows a lot about the science stuff, Professor Dave explains. In the previous tutorial, we covered the marine segmented worms, sometimes called polychaetes. In this tutorial, we are going to cover the terrestrial and freshwater segmented worms of clade Clytolata. This includes the earthworms and their relatives, sometimes called oligochaetes, as well as the leeches. Members of this clade are unique in that they all have a reproductive structure known as a clitellum, found on no animals outside of Clytolata. The clitellum is a ring of mucus-secreting cells in the epidermis that appears in the worm's exterior as a fat band around the body, about one-third of the body length from the anterior end. It superficially resembles a bandage in many species and is always present in the earthworms and other oligochaetes. It appears only during the reproductive season in leeches. In addition to the clitellum, all members of Clytolata are also hermaphroditic, or monoecious, and young develop inside a cocoon secreted by the clitellum after fertilization. In order to cover Clytolata, we will examine their diversity, oligochaete form and function, feeding, body systems, behavior, reproduction and development, and their ecological significance. We will then conclude by going over class Hyrudinia, the leeches. Let's start by going back to our cladogram. Notice that Clytolata is a monophyletic grouping within Annelida. The oligochaetes are generally considered to consist of these three families here, Nididae, Eolosomatidae, and Lumbricidae, though like the term polychaete, the term oligochaete is often considered to be merely descriptive. Lumbricidae contains the vast majority of animals commonly referred to as earthworms, or nightcrawlers. There are at least 6,000 valid species, of which more than 30 are now found around the world, mostly due to human activities. That is, agricultural practices that brought earthworms to areas where they are not native. Though they will be the primary stars of this video, it's worth mentioning that the other two families include freshwater species such as the microscopic Eolosoma, Stylaria, and Darrow worms, as well as the common Tubifex, or sludge worm, notorious for their durability and resistance to oxygen-poor environments. Hyrudinida is split into three orders, the true leeches of Hyrudinia, all of which have 34 segments, lack setae, and possess anterior and posterior suckers, the 27 segmented acanthodeledons, and the 14 or 15 segmented branchiodeledons. Wrapping up diversity, it's important to note that there are over 8,000 species of segmented clitellates, making them an incredibly successful clade, though the earthworms dominate in terms of biomass and species diversity. Earthworms are terrestrial invertebrates that exhibit a tube-within-a-tube -tube body plan. The outer tube is their skin, or integumentary system. The inner tube is the coelom, which surrounds the digestive system. They burrow into moist, rich soil, and usually live within branched, interconnected tunnels. The most familiar species is likely Lumbricus terrestris, or the common earthworm that was likely native to Western Europe, but is now distributed around the world. It is considered to be a relatively large species, but it pales in comparison to the giant earthworms that can reach lengths of at least 4 meters, or more than 12 feet. Members of this clade all lack parapodia, and most use peristaltic movement to travel within their burrows. Essentially, muscles contract to make the individual segments short or wide. When a segment widens, setae dig into the burrow walls and anchor the segment. The worm reaches forward and pushes itself along. Contrary to popular belief, most oligochaetes are scavengers. Earthworms, for example, feed mainly on decaying organic matter, like living protozoa, rotifers, bacteria, fungi, bits of leaves and vegetation, waste, and animal matter. They don't actually eat soil itself. Though some species may often have an intestine full of dirt, they're not actually eating the inorganic part of the soil. They're trying to filter out the organic edible bits. Many species will actually emerge from their burrows at night, hence the common name nightcrawler, in search of organic matter to pull into their burrows. Some will store food underground until it starts to rot. Then they pull the organic matter inward using their muscular pharynx. Soil is often incidentally ingested along with the food. 
In terms of body systems, earthworms have a complete digestive system. After food is drawn into the mouth through the pharynx, it passes down the esophagus and is temporarily stored within the crop before being passed to the gizzard, where it is ground into small pieces. Ground food is then passed to the intestine, where digestion and absorption can take place. Undigested food is passed out the anus in the form of a nutrient-rich cast that can help to fertilize soil around the earthworm. In addition to the complete digestive system, annelids also have a closed circulatory system comprised of a single dorsal blood vessel that functions as a true heart, and a single ventral vessel that serves as an aorta. In the anterior region, it is split into five pairs of aortic arches that maintain a steady pressure of blood. The ventral vessel receives blood from the aortic arches and delivers it to the brain and the rest of the body. Earthworms have no respiratory system. Gas exchange occurs across their moist skin. This means that earthworms need some form of airflow within their burrows. This is why they are often forced out of their burrows when it rains to avoid drowning. Then, when the water seeps further into the ground, they return to their burrows if they can find them. The earthworm excretory system consists of a pair of metanephridia on each segment, except the first three anterior segments and the final posterior segment. The nephridium is comprised of a series of complex tubes and a small bladder. Wastes are filtered from the blood and excreted through the individual nephridiopores that are located on every segment that bears metanephridia. Aquatic clitolates secrete ammonia, and most terrestrial species, like earthworms, secrete urea. An individual worm's reproductive system consists of both male and female organs. The earthworm nervous system consists of a pair of cerebral ganglia above the pharynx. The pharynx itself is connected through numerous nerve fibers, and sensory endings line the snout-like prostomium. A ventral nerve cord follows from the brain underneath the coelom. They also have simple chemosensory and tactile organs distributed throughout the body. Though earthworms have no eyes, they do have photoreceptors within their epidermis and thus can sense light. Earthworm behavior is interesting because earthworms are perhaps some of the most defenseless animals in the world. They lack any type of barbs or pinchers. They are non-venomous. They lack poison glands, hard shells, teeth, or a protective coating of any kind, and yet they are incredibly abundant organisms. They react to light, chemical, and tactile stimuli. Experimental evidence indicates that earthworms have the ability to learn. They can be taught to avoid negative stimuli and develop an association reflex. Communication between individual worms is incredibly important, especially during mating. Reproduction in earthworms is complex and involves simultaneous sperm transfer between hermaphrodites. Their reproductive organs are housed in segments 9 to 15. Their male organs consist of two pairs of testes and two pairs of sperm funnels surrounded by three large seminal vesicles. Sperm is expelled from segment 15 during copulation, and eggs are discharged from segment 14. Earthworms may mate any time of the year as long as warm, moist weather prevails at night. Before mating, they poke their heads into the burrows of their neighbors, looking for a partner. If they encounter another earthworm, the two extend their anterior ends and bring their ventral sides together. They secrete mucus from their clitellum that temporarily glues them together. Simultaneously, they discharge sperm, which travel down their ventral groove into the seminal receptacles of their partner. Copulation may take several hours, after which each worm's seminal receptacle now houses their partner's sperm. Afterwards, each worm will create a mucus tube and a tough band that forms a cocoon around the clitellum. The cocoon then passes anteriorly towards the worm's head. As it moves, it collects eggs from the oviducts, albumin from skin glands, and stored sperm from the worm's mate. Within the cocoon, the eggs are fertilized. Eventually, it passes over the anterior end of the worm and its ends close, forming a seal. The fertilized eggs develop directly in the cocoon and tiny juvenile worms hatch. They will develop their clitellum when they are sexually mature. Contrary to popular belief, most earthworms cannot reproduce asexually. Cutting an earthworm in half will usually result in a dead or greatly injured worm.
though some species can reproduce parthenogenically, that is, the young develop directly from unfertilized eggs. They cannot reproduce through any form of breakage. Earthworms have a profound ecological impact on the terrestrial environment that has been appreciated since at least the time of Aristotle, who called earthworms the intestines of the soil. Indeed, earthworms do ingest a great quantity of soil, trying to get to the edible bits within the detritus. In doing so, they add nitrogenous products from their metabolism and extract heavy metals and other contaminants, which they encapsulate and render ecologically inert. Their activities aerate the soil, and they physically bring decaying materials like leaves, twigs, and organic material closer to the roots of trees. Any material they do not consume is fertilizer for the trees, and their waste products further fertilize the soil. Their presence has been found to greatly increase the health of food crops, reduce farmers' dependence on fertilizers and pesticides, and recycle organic material through composting into usable soil. However, quite a few species that are beneficial to human crops are confirmed environmental pests. The common earthworm, for example, is a pest species in North America. If you live in North America and you've seen an earthworm outside, it was probably this species, and it's not native. However, it thrives in North American soils where it greatly reduces leaf litter, reduces native plant growth, outcompetes native annelids, and often aids in the growth of invasive plants. Though earthworms have many positive impacts, like anything, they are not a panacea. Simply throwing non-native earthworms into your backyard garden may indeed help your crops grow, but when these worms escape, they can damage native species. Moving on from the oligochaetes, let's finish up by touching on the leeches. As we mentioned, all members of Herudinida have a set number of segments. The true leeches have exactly 34 segments, a posterior sucker for attachment, and an anterior sucker that houses the mouth, and three piercing jaws that leave a distinct scar after feeding. Their guts are specialized for storage of large quantities of blood. Most leeches crawl like inchworms, looping the body by attaching one sucker and then the other. Most have eyes, and the terrestrial land leeches, common to rainforests of the Indo-Pacific, have five pairs of eyes and the ability to seek out prey on land. They are known to climb trees in search of warm-blooded vertebrates to parasitize, such as birds or mammals. Though leeches are most infamous as parasites, there are many active predatory freshwater leeches, such as the tiger leech, that force their pharynx into an opening of a small animal and entirely drain it of its fluids. Perhaps the most well-known species of leech is Herudo medicinalis, the European medicinal leech, which is actually one of several species of so-called medicinal leeches. These leeches, and all true blood-sucking leeches, have salivary glands that secrete an anesthetic, as well as an anticoagulant and at least 60 other proteins. Though historically they were used primarily in bloodletting or leech therapy, they are still used in modern medical practices, mostly to stimulate circulation to skin grafts, reattached fingers, and reconstructive surgery of the ear, nose, lip, and eyelid. With that, we wrap up the segmented worms of Phylum Annelida. Let's move forward and examine the ribbon worms of Phylum Nemertea next. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.